What is the unconsciousness? Is it really that critical to understand one's behavior? Find out more in this episode where we are going to learn about Sigmund Freud and his theory. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode. My name is Aya Bansaron and I am 16 years old. The father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, was a psychologist, physiologist, medical doctor, and influential thinker of the early 20th century. Some biographical information. He was born in 1856, he spent most of his life in Vienna, Austria, but he escaped to London soon after retreating there at the beginning of World War II as the Nazis began to occupy where he lived, and he died in London. So, have you ever liked somebody or disliked them and not know why? Have you ever forgotten somebody's name at exactly the wrong time? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you are doing something or you are arguing for something or making a decision for reasons that you can't fully articulate? Have you ever called out the wrong name in the throes of passion? This is all the Freudian unconscious. The idea is that we do these things. These things are explained in terms of cognitive systems that we are not aware of. And this is what Freud called the unconscious mind, which, according to him, was not a rational reasonable element, but through distinct processes in violent internal conflicts, affecting massively the way you act and think. Those three parts are the ID, the ego, and the superego. The ID is said to be the animal part of the human, present at birth. This means that he only wants to eat, drink, pee, get warm, and have sexual satisfaction. In the words of Freud, the ID works on the pleasure principle, a polymorphous perversity. The superego is that part which contains the conscious, namely socially acquired control mechanisms which have been internalized and which are usually imparted in the first instance by the parents and the society, also religion if any later. The superego seeks to limit the blind, pleasure-seeking drives of the ID by the imposition of restrictive rules. While the ego is the conscious self that is created by the dynamic tensions and interactions between the ID and the superego, it has the task of reconciling their conflicting demands with the requirements of external reality. The ego copes with those desires, it plans to either satisfy them or suppress them. Disclaimer. It is important to note that what is being offered here is indeed a theoretical model rather than a description of an observable object, which functions as a frame of reference to explain the link between early childhood experience and the major adult normal or dysfunctional personality. This led to a theory of child development or psychosexual development, which he described in five stages. The first one is called the oral stage. Initially, infants gain such release and derive such pleasure from the act of sucking. The mouth of the infant is her or her primary erogenous zone. This is followed by a stage in which the focus of pleasure or energy release is the anus, particularly in the act of defecation, and this is accordingly termed the anal stage. Then the focus of pleasure shifts to the genitals. This is the phallic stage. The young child develops an interest in its sexual organs as a site of pleasure and develops a deep sexual attraction for the parents of the opposite sex and a hatred of the parents of the same sex, better known as the Oedipus complex. This, however, gives rise to feelings of guilt in the child who recognizes that he can never supplant the stronger parent. A male child also perceives himself to be at risk. He fears that if he persists in pursuing the sexual attraction for his mother, he may be harmed by the father. Specifically, he comes to fear that he may be castrated. This is termed castration anxiety. Both the attraction and the hatred are usually repressed, and the child usually resolves the conflict of the Oedipus complex by coming to identify with the parent of the same sex. This happens at the age of five, where open the child enters a latency period in which sexual motivations become much less pronounced. This lasts until puberty when major genital development begins and the pleasure drives refocuses around the genital area. Here occurs the last stage, the genital stage, the healthy adult stage, the final stage of human psychosexual development where the individual develops a strong sexual interest in people outside of the family. 
Now, Freud described a lot of normal life in terms of different ways the mind chooses to keep those horrible ideas of the superego from the idea making its way to consciousness, and he called these defense mechanisms. You are defending yourself against the horrible parts of yourself. Anna Freud was the one to identify those mechanisms appearing in her father's work, Sigmund Freud. Some of these defense mechanisms are sublimation, in which socially unacceptable impulses or idealizations are transformed into socially acceptable actions or behavior, possibly resulting in a long-term conversion of the initial impulse. We can imagine a great artist like Picasso turning his sexual or aggressive energy into his artwork. Another one is projection, which is projecting one's impulses and comfortable and acceptable thoughts, feelings, or motives to another person. For instance, you might hate someone, but your super ego tells you that such hatred is unacceptable. You can solve the problem by believing that they hate you. Another one is rationalization, which is a defense mechanism in which controversial behaviors or feelings are justified and explained in a seemingly rational or logical manner to avoid the true explanation and are made consciously tolerable or even admirable superior by plausible means. More simply, when you do something or think something bad, you rationalize it and you give it a more socially acceptable explanation. A good example might be for a parent who enjoys smacking his child. He will not typically say, I enjoy smacking my child, rather he will say, it's for the child's own good, I'm being a good parent by doing this. And there is much more that is for Freud, not the slightest bit pathological, but rather totally normal processes. Now. Sometimes those tools will work, but sometimes they do not. They might go awry and lead to a phase called history. This term is not used lately, but was popular in Freud's time. The question is, should we or not believe Freud's theories and how well it fits with our modern science? Of course, many critics believe that is not the slightest bit true. That is because they believe a theory can be true only if there is any chance to prove it wrong. And this is the problem with the psychoanalysis. It can never be proven wrong. With this aroused many other questions, but the answer differs from person to person. With that being said, I encourage you to look more into it and find an answer for yourself. This is the end of today's episode. Subscribe for more. Bye!